Hey guys, what's going on? Excited to be up here in Oklahoma City, the Western Heritage Museum. We're here for the 60th anniversary of Western Heritage Awards. And so uh, we got some interviews lined up. I'm excited to sit down with Mr. Barry Corbin, Patrick Wayne, and Mr. Michael Brower. And uh, man, there's a lot of excitement going on. We've been here all day and uh, I'm really excited to sit down with those guys and then of course see the ceremony later tonight. So. Um, Enjoy the show, and uh, until next time, stay grateful. This episode is brought to you by Morris Stock Dogs, where champions are bred. For training tips, puppies for sale, or more information, check out morrisstockdogs.com. The Converse Cowboy Journey has given me an opportunity to sit down with some amazing performers from all walks of life where it is my job to tease out their habits and routines so that you can apply and test in your own life. I've learned, I've grown personally, I've been enlightened, and I've been humbled. Above all, I've realized there is no destination in this life, no goal achieved or money made that can replace the feeling of flow and the pursuit of doing what you truly love to do. With a growth mindset, I'm constantly asking questions and pursuing knowledge. The Converse Cowboy is a platform that allows me to do just that. I'm excited and eager to share their stories with you all. I'm Mike Roberts, and this is The Converse Cowboy. Brought to you by Kerry Kelly Bits and Spurs and Schaefer Outfitter. And this is not your first time on the show. I think this is actually my first repeat guest, so I appreciate you coming back on. Well, my pleasure. Good to be here. Yes, sir. It's a pleasure to meet you in person. And um, we're up here in Oklahoma City for the 60th anniversary Western Heritage Award Ceremony. It's going to take place tonight. Um, and so I've got a number of things I want to, to chat with you about. I was I was inspired by your story, you know, when I did the research the first time and then digging in again this time. So I'll start here, since we are in Oklahoma City, what this Western Heritage means to you. I know it's been a big part of your life and your career. I'm curious to know what this specific event means to you. Uh, well, this particular place means a lot to me. This... Uh We've, uh, uh, we're a civilization that is a, an amalgamation of a whole lot of civilizations. Uh, people from all over the world flocked to this part of the country. Back in the uh, 19th and uh, early 20th century, uh, some of them by force, you know, like the Trail of Tears, the, mm -hmm. the Cherokees and the uh, all the other uh, eastern tribes were forced to come here. And uh, they got some, uh, what everybody thought was useless land. And uh, fortunately for a lot of them, there was oil underneath. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyhow, the, the, the Europeans came. People came over, came in wagons, came in uh, in. Uh, Horseback came uh, with uh, wheelbarrows, had all their belongings in wheelbarrows, and uh, walked all the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a uh, it was a great uh, exodus from uh, tyranny and uh, and uh, poverty in yes, Europe, sir. and. Uh, they came for a better life. And there was, you know, of course, there was tension. There was, uh, uh, there was, there was war. Right. We were, we were displacing people who were here before. Yes, sir. And uh, uh, fortunately, we're, we're solving that problem now. It's, uh, we're, we're getting, uh, we're getting a lot better. And we'll continue to get better. Yes, sir. What, what we've got to remember about this uh, this whole thing is that we are all Americans. We're all on the same side. We're trying to get the same thing done from different directions. Right. And uh, now we've seemed to, because of this uh, shutdown from the COVID, I think, we've uh, become tribal. We've become uh, considering the other side, whatever the other side is, the enemy. Right. We're not enemies. Yes, sir. We're uh, we're friends. We're Americans, and uh, we need to get back to that idea. Yeah. 
I agree with and you. And this place is 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 something that, that can bring us together. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why it's important. <coughs> Excuse me, particularly now. Oh boy, I got these allergies. These allergies come in, and you got uh, you know start sneezing, yeah. coughing. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody thinks because they got the the COVID nineteen Delta, whatever it is. That if you sneeze once, by God, you better run. Yeah, they start running. <laughs> yeah. But I've been tested. I, I just got, got through the movie. I was tested every day. What did you do? What, what's the Can you talk about it? It's called uh, The Killers of the Flower Moon. Okay. It's a Martin Scorsese movie, and it's got uh, in the leads uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and uh, Heard of him. Robert De Niro. And uh, you know, a bunch of young people, young actors. Heck yeah, where y'all film that at? And uh, up in Pawhuska, uh, around Pawhuska, Oklahoma. Okay. Heck yeah, when will that come out? I would imagine probably next year, uh, either in the summer or fall next year. I got you. How, was that your first time working with Scorsese? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How was that? Oh, it was good. We had a we had a good. Uh, Good time. He was, uh, I didn't, I had one uh, kind of a nice little scene, and then the rest of it, I'm kind of just there. I show up all the time. I play the undertaker in the thing. So I'm just, you know, I come in. I, I was there a long time, but I, would, I didn't work a lot. That's somewhat of a new role for you, huh? Like, how do you go into a new role like that? How does Barry Corbin prepare for something like that? Mm, well, I, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> well, you've been doing this a long time, and you're damn good at it. And so I think there's a number of, I would think, a number of actors out there um, that would love to hear your answer to that. Um, and I'm sure you line up 10 different actors, they may say 10 different answers. Yeah, well, my, uh, my, my thing is when I look at a script, I, I look uh, for the similarities to me. What am, how am I like this character? Mm. And then I think, well, okay, I'm this, 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 this. And then I think, well, what? How are, how are we not alike? And so I, I try to make it as much like me as I can because I'm the one they're hiring. I'm the instrument that they're playing, mm. you know. And uh, if uh, you know, if it requires another another accent or another something, I, I do that. But. Uh, Normally, I just I, I play as close to me as possible. Hmm. And uh, this undertaker is not a he's not a very nice man. He's a uh, kind of a crooked undertaker. And uh, I wouldn't steal from dead people, but he does. <laughs> <laughs> if you're playing as close to you as possible, I've gotten to know you a little bit. Um, I would have to think Roscoe Brown was a challenge from for you then well Roscoe not knowing how to was, ride a horse really and being the yeah I'd kind of forget how to ride a horse and that <clears throat> I, I was playing a town man who's uh, not used to being horseback not used to being in the in the uh, in the woods and yeah. situation like that yeah also not real swift in his mind you know <laughs> That's a very kind way to say it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to shift gears and go back and kind of segue off the first thing you were talking about, this area in particular and, and the cowboy culture. There seems to be like waves of like cool to be cowboy movements, and it seems like we're in another one right now. Like it was cool to be a cowboy with the John Wayne stuff, and then you were a part of the urban cowboy scene, and I'm sure you saw all, all and felt all of that. And now it's like Yellowstone has brought on this. Yeah, there's another, another wave, wave of it. Of it. Uh, and uh, I don't know that we're going to have a big wave of Western uh, uh, movies okay. because uh, people don't really know how to make them anymore. And all the equipment that we've uh, that we had, you know, all the wagons have gone in disrepair, and uh, we don't have the movie horses we used to have. I gotta ask because I'm not I'm naive to that world when you say they don't know how to make them. Like those movies anymore? What does that mean? Well, they you you get uh, uh, 
get a lot of young young guys, you know, they say, oh, yeah, I ride a horse, you know. They don't have the first name, first idea about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, used to, if a fella didn't know how, he'd do something, he'd go learn. But they think, well, if they got on a horse in, in summer camp one time, then they know how to ride, you know. Yeah. Well, a uh, horse, you know, wants to do what you want him to do, but if you don't tell him what to do, he's going to do whatever he wants to do. Yeah. Yeah. So you've, uh, you know, you got to, <laughs> you got some problems, you know. A bad rider can ruin a good horse in an hour. <laughs> So. Why do you think that is, though? Why is there those those waves of like wanting to be a cowboy, wanting to go buy the cowboy hat and and live the cowboy lifestyle? Do you think it's the romantic version that people see on TV, or do you think there's like some purity in it that they want to live that cowboy lifestyle? Well, they want to they they want to go back to a simpler time, I think, and I think it's always been the case. I think even in the time of the great train robbery, you know, that that was a popular thing, the guy shooting into the camera and all in the train hold up and all yeah. that. People wanted to go back from to a simpler time. And then as we go along, Tom Mix, you know, was a kind of a uh, the flashy hero, you know. Mm -hmm. He, he kind of took the place of uh, William S. Hart, who was more more of a realistic kind of a right. kind of a cowboy. Right. A good Good bad man, or a bad good man, or whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> you've got a quote, man, and when I read this, I, I loved it. You say, You've got to be an infant on the inside, but you've got to have the hide of a rhinoceros. And um, I, I have to think you're referring to constantly going to these auditions and being told no, and constantly well, you've, showing you've up. Got to, you've, you've got to have the. Uh, it's not so much confidence, it's. Uh, it's stubbornness. <laughs> you know, you've got to, uh, you know, you got to consider most people, they get out of school, they go to work somewhere, and uh, for uh, probably at least half the people in the, in the country, they stay with that job throughout their lives and they retire. Mm -hmm. The only rejections they have are in their personal life. Uh now, a fella like, uh, you know, a guy might hop around, might, have, might change jobs every, every six or seven years. Well, maybe he's turned down three or four times before he finds the next job. Right. Uh, with, with us, our, our people, we, we're rejected uh, six or seven times a day. <laughs> you know, and you think, well, it's not me, it's just because they're, what, who they're looking for. Well, eventually you come to the realization that it is you because we're, sales, we're salesmen and the only product we have to sell is us. Mm -hmm. So you, you think, well, what do I do to make myself more marketable? And uh, you, can, you, know, you can think about all these things uh, as much as you want to, but you're not ever going to solve the problem. How did you keep showing up? How did you keep overcoming that rejection? I didn't have anything else to do. You burned the boats. I you, said, you, I, I, no, no they, they said, plan. you've got to have a, something to fall back on. I said, uh, no. If I do that, I'm going to fall back on it. I'm going to live. <laughs> I'm going to make a living. If I have to dig ditches or fry hamburgers at McDonald's or do something like that, I'll make a living. But uh, if I... If I allow myself to cop out some easy way to do that, then I'm going to do it. Yeah, I love that. Then when I got to be in my in my thirties, I started thinking, well, I I need to do something to make money, and I couldn't figure out what to do. I was running for work by that time. Yeah, because it took you a long time, and and I think that's what. I want listeners to hear the most. Like you didn't land that gig on Urban Cowboy till what thirty eight. I was thirty eight. Yeah. And um, I have to think you were making some money along the way, but that was like your first big gig, right? Oh, I was gig, making. Right? I was. I was making a, a bare living. You yeah. know. I mean, I was poverty level, but I was making a living. Uh, 
doing theater, you know, all across the country, but that doesn't pay a whole lot. Yeah. Where does that drive come from to stick with it all of those years and play the long game, knowing that's what you want to do? And if you had advice for a young young actor out there, any really anybody young that's starting the real world. Starting in the what, in what this you business, them? you've got to well, number one, you got to be very, very naive. Uh, I I had no idea what I was getting into when I got into it. Uh, I had no idea the competition I'd be against. I had no idea that, uh, and I was I was very lucky. I mean, I was I didn't have to do a whole lot of stuff other than acting uh, until after I was say twenty. 25 or something like that. I was, I was, worked pretty steady. Mm -hmm. I didn't make a lot of money, but I worked pretty steady. Right. I didn't have anything, but I still don't have anything. <laughs> I don't need anything. <laughs> That's what musicians tell me. They'll, they'll say, I've been broke before and I can be broke again. Well, yeah. I don't believe that about what you just said either, but that is, man, there is some type of mentality that it's like that grind mentality is always in the background. Well, I just, I don't know. You know, I, I probably have some, some stuff. I don't know. I don't own my own car. I don't own my own house. I don't have anything. What do you do? You rent them? No, I, I've, uh, my uh, daughter owns a car. Hmm. And uh, I think... Uh, my company owns my house. I don't Smart know. Man. I, I got no idea what I've got. A savvy brain. You have a savvy mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you have. <laughs> Which is the best investment you can really make is, you know, into yourself. And it sounds like that's what you did, investing in yourself, doing what you truly love to do, which in the society we live in, it, it's like that takes the back seat sometimes. We're told, go to school, get a good job. Yeah, get it. Get, get, make get, money. Go, go get money. Well, money, yeah. money is a false idea. Money, money's not worth anything in itself. I mean, mm -hmm. what's that worth? That napkin over there is worth as much as a $100 bill, if you say it is. Yeah, it's whatever we agree on as a yeah. society, right? It's not, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd just soon not have any money, not use it, you know, but uh, you got to have something, you know, have beads or have something to... Trade. Trade. Yeah, yeah. I'm one of those, I, I'll tell you what my, my philosophy is. I'm one of the guys that back in the days of the caveman, you know, there was, there was a guy who would go around from, he'd go from one place to another. He'd tell stories. and He'd tell about the news of what was happening in the world. He'd tell all these stories. And he'd sit around and tell stories and, and uh, eat their food and drink their beer and do whatever, he, you know, until they got tired of him and run him off. And then he'd go to the next village. And they and he was he was very welcome there for a while. And then they'd run him off. Well, that's what I am. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the guy that they run off. I don't see anybody running you off. I see you <laughs> sitting around telling the stories, though. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's the way you make a living, you know. And you, I but I I don't overstay my welcome. <laughs> okay, so what makes a good storyteller? Well, you know, just uh, I I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And this is, and I asked that specifically. That's a, a selfish question because I would like to be a better storyteller. And I I listen to the Matthew McConaughey's of the world, one of the great storytellers, um, and, and, and all of those that are out there. Um, but I'm curious, you're one of them. If you had any advice for me, how could I be a better storyteller? Well, try not to ramble too much. You know, a lot of times a fella sits down and tell a story, and, and pretty soon you got some old, some old coot like uh, uh, character Gabby Hayes played just... Uh, just rambling on about things and talking in nonsense. You know, you don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. You want to have a point to your story, you know. You have an have intention. A point, point of view. Okay. And uh, you want to kind of keep it uh, consistent with, uh, you know, you, you want to start at the beginning and, and go through to, to a 
uh, a climax and then an ending, you know? Mm -hmm. I have to think you have that intuition. Like, you intuitively know. It's a, it, it is an intuition. Yeah. It's not something that I, saw, I, I think about. It's something mm -hmm. that, uh, that just, that's natural. Yes, sir. Well, I know we're short on time. Um, I've got one more question for you, and then I'll let you let you get get to your day. Um, if you could have a message, if you could get a message out to millions of people, metaphorically speaking, and put that on a billboard, what does your message say? Be kind to each other. Stop all this squabbling and fighting, and be kind to each other. Respect the other fellow's opinion. That would be it. Love it. I love it. Mr. Barry, I appreciate your time on the show. My pleasure. Yes, Thank sir. You. you bet. So this is just a conversation. So the name of the show is The Converse Cowboy, clearly because of the converse and the hat, and also it's a play on words, The Converse Cowboy. So um, I was curious to, to hear your story, Patrick, when I heard you were going to be here. We are in Oklahoma City at the Western Heritage 60th anniversary um, for awards, celebrating those in film, creating art in film, TV, music, literature. literature. Yes, sir. Um, so broad question. I'm going to just throw that one out there. What does it mean for you to be here? I know you've been a part of this for a long time. And then we'll dive into, and I know we're short on time, so we'll dive into a brief bit of um, what got you here today. <laughs> Uh, it's interesting. Yeah, I was here the uh, the year it opened in 1960, and a couple of years ago, when I was inducted into the uh, Hall of Great Western Performers, they had a black and white video uh, kinescope or some of of, of that a uh, afternoon. I was so young then, um, so I've been uh, coming back ever since. Uh, but actually, over the years, I began to appreciate and understand what this uh, whole a museum means um, to Oklahoma and to the country in, in particular. Um, uh, I've been invited many times to come here uh, and to present honor, to present awards to people, and I always come because I really appreciate this museum. Across the country, museums are having a tough time, but the, this museum is is robust and they've got great support. And it's important that this museum succeeds. It it, it represents an idea and a sentiment. And the core values of what uh, what America's all about, where it started, what its heritage is, and these values are still very important. And uh, you know, the pendulum is swinging one way, but it swings back. And I hope that uh, young people realize, you know, what the core values of America are. Yes, sir. Embrace them. Well, I think you're seeing. I that. don't even know if I'm answering your question. No, but that's I, kind of it's a beautiful answer. Um, and I think you're seeing that now. Like it's another wave of it's cool to be a cowboy again. You know, and with the turnout that was here for the 11 o'clock panel. Wow, that was really impressive. Uh, Honor is due to Robert Duvall. He was great, too. And uh, But I've been to these uh, 11 o'clock interviews before, and they didn't have half the crowd that came today. So that's good. That's uh, And it also means that people are, you know, brave enough to uh, get out of the— uh, staying at home and uh, getting out and being among people again yeah. in social situations, which uh, hopefully— Enough people get vaccinated and uh, things take over. I mean, I did get COVID. I had it about six weeks ago, but I had been vaccinated. So fortunately, I didn't need to be hospitalized. It was just a very bad flu. And I did qualify to get this uh, monoclonal antibody infusion, which just really took care. I was like a miracle drug. Right on. Yeah, it really worked well. I've heard, I've heard good things about it. Um, okay, I'll dig in just to, just briefly. Um, so I know you started, and get, if I get any of these facts wrong, let me know. But you started in the film industry around the age of nine. I did, yes. Around the age of nine, and you did around 40 films. Yeah. And about, I don't know, 10, 11 with your father, John Wayne. Okay, that's pretty close. Okay. So my question is, and this show is a lot about mindset and overcoming expectations, and I can't think of a bigger expectation than to try to fill the boots of John Wayne. So I'm curious to know, did you feel any external expectation or maybe like even expectations from yourself as an actor to live up to that or maybe even go beyond what he did? Okay. I'm going to tell you right now, that is a really not a good expectation to have. I would never even uh, attempt to um, go in that direction. 
Uh, my my whole idea was, you know, find something that you're happy doing and see if you can do it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I learned early on that uh, I really enjoyed uh, the whole business of working in films and television and uh, theater. And um, I fortunately made uh, a career of it and got, uh, you know, successful. So, you know, that's what it had nothing to do with <laughs> trying to compete with or be better than just different. You know, it's just different, different, different deal. How was that? Like, uh, I, I think back to uh, Big Jake. That was one of my favorites growing up. Like, how was that acting with your father? Was that? It's it's so amazing. It's so great. Um, it's different. It's it's different than like when you're working um, in a, a film with a normal situation, um, actor director, let's say. So you prepare your role and you come to the set and you plan to do it a certain way and you have your idea about this character and how it's going to evolve in the film. And the director, he has a bigger uh, understanding of the overall approach to the whole film and how maybe I can play in it. So you have a discussion with uh, the director and you work out some understanding of how his ideas and your ideas can come together and, uh, and you proceed. When I'm working with my dad, he says, do it this way. And I say, okay, dad. <laughs> <laughs> like the scene. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's a it's a repeat of uh, reality. Yeah, yeah, it's just another extension of reality. Right on, right on. Well, I know you're short on time. I appreciate you you coming in and happy, visiting with us happy today. Happy to, yeah. And I look forward to seeing you later on at the ceremony. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Oh, I got one question. So this is the last question, and we ask this to anybody that comes on the show. Um, if you could get a message out to millions of people, metaphorically speaking. Put it on a billboard to get a message out to millions of people. What would your message say? Uh, <laughs> that's there's so many, and there's only one billboard to go with. I don't know. Just live life to the fullest. Patrick, I appreciate it. Okay, my friend. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Michael Grower, curator of the National Cowboy Western Heritage Museum. And so you've been a curator for 40 years. Yes, sir. How long have you been here? I've been here three years, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, most of my career I spent at the Panhandle Plains Historical Museum over in Canyon, Texas, okay. just south of Amarillo. Right on. Uh, I was curator of Art and Western Heritage over there and I uh, was recruited to come over here for about five years before I decided it was time to do, do something a little different and uh, come over here in 2018. Okay. And I know you've got a book out. It was, it was released last year. Is that yeah, right? That's correct. Making a Hand, the yeah. Art of H.D. Bugby. That's correct. And I definitely want to get into some of that. Before we do, what is it about this Western heritage? What is it about being a curator that drew you to it all those years ago? Well, you know, people always ask me how I got into being a, a Western art or a cowboy historian, and it really starts when I was a little kid on my grandfather's farm up in northeastern Kansas. He always had horses and a few cows around, and, and I can remember being, uh, you know, just a toddler and getting up even before grandpa did and going down to the horse corrals and just hanging over the fence, looking at the horses Mm -hmm. and begging to be put on the back of one of them. And there's pictures of me on the back of horses when I was two or three years old. Um, Too young to be getting in the corrals when you're you're like that, but nevertheless, it's what I did. And so, you know, I always only wanted to be two things. One was a cowboy and one was a professional football player. And and uh, God did not make me run faster than a 5240, so that ended the pro- <laughs> that ended the professional career, and I never reached 510. So uh, yeah. he gave me 57, and that's all I could do. But, Fair uh, enough. Uh, so any, as soon as I could read, I read anything I could get my hands on on the American West, and mostly about cowboys. And, and uh, so I've been doing that, researching cowboys, doing cowboy stuff ever since. So that's interesting, you know. Every at least from from myself, I wanted to be a cowboy growing up, and I know a lot of kids want to be cowboys and shoot guns and ride horses. But you said you went to books. I went to books, and then also worked cows, you know, farm work and, and working cows, doctoring cows, and that sort of stuff. Um, but you know, I wanted to get the history because I'm a history uh, nut. Anything I can learn, um, and I, I learned both by by the documentation and also by doing. So, mm-hmm. for example, I do a living history program and uh, have gone to ropers to learn how to rope properly, for example, um, and, and various things. And, uh, you know, saddling horses, I've been doing that a long time, but, uh, you know, getting on the back of a horse is one thing, cowboy is another one. And uh, mm-hmm. so I have to know, I have to be in a place, uh, historical site, whatever it is, to get to know it. I'm a, for example, I'm president of the Western Cattle Trail Association and standing in the ruts where those six million cows went up the trail as far north as Western Canada, that does something to you spiritually. 
mm-hmm. and you know the the whole cowboy thing uh i have found is uh you know there's no more recognizable symbol worldwide nor is there something everyone in the world at one time or another wanted to be than than a cowboy yes, sir. Uh, and so i think it's that spiritual draw there's something there's something special about that uh but but it gets skewed by popular mythology especially in terms of popular culture literature whatever it is films etc um where they dramatize certain things that really weren't part of it uh so where my interest really lies is actually in cow and horse work um and those anonymous cowboys that nobody knows the names of right. and yet they did the work that nobody wanted to do catchphrase these days you you hear about that all the time yeah for low wages bad food uh dangerous and boring working conditions and built america mm-hmm. and and as i like to say uh this great country was built on beef and bread not on broccoli uh i like broccoli um but it was built on uh, on uh, blood sweat and tears and lives of those uh, those cowboys that pushed those cows up those trails and also helped establish those cattle ranches yeah uh, and then wanted to continue that tradition even to today mhm i've got friends good friends that are full time cowboys and and i do i'm one of the i'll admit it i'm the one that wants to go when we need to go rope and doctor something and yep. but the days the checking fence and fixing mm-hmm. fence and water lines and all the stuff that they don't show in the movies nope. is what makes those guys, well, in my opinion, cowboys. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge, uh, and it was a challenge for those who, who saw the attraction of that lifestyle in the 19th century. How do we, how do we make it sexier? So you had gunplay and you had romance, you mm-hmm. know. Um, when, I don't know if you were here earlier today when we had a uh, a guest panel of four different uh, Western actors, yes, sir, including Robert Duvall, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, you know it, it was pretty special when they were talking about uh, that that whole mythology that comes through from what they're what they're doing and uh, and how how much it's been romanticized and how far from the truth it is. Yeah. Um, and Robert Duvall talked about the people that he leaned on were the wranglers and the and the stunt men and the one who, ones who actually did the work. Yeah, and really, that's what we're talking about is the men who did the work. Yeah, what's your opinion on that? You know, like there is that wave of cool to be a cowboy, and I was talking about this earlier with Barry Corbin, um, John Wayne's era, and then of course when Barry was in um, Urban Cowboy. Right. I wouldn't call that a western necessarily, but it was it made cowboy being a cowboy cool. And then of course now we have Yellowstone. Like there's right. another cool to be a cowboy movement coming. Yep. What is it? What are your thoughts on that? And like, what is it you think people should focus on? Well, it's, it's all, everything, history is always cyclical. Everything comes sure. in cycles. And so, you know, there was a, a great cycle in the first part of the 1900s with a huge wave of Western fiction, and that spawned all kinds of its own things. And you have another wave in the 1930s with the singing cowboys, Roy and Gene, mm-hmm. doing what they do in the B-Westerns, where, which would be the second feature on a, in, a, in a movie theater. And then there's another wave in the 50s and 60s with the television Westerns. Yes, sir. When all this merchandise is out there, you know, you know kids' play sets and lunch boxes and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, where it, it, Westerns are so popular, they even have their own Emmy category. People forget how many Westerns were on TV right. at one time. And then they, the, the Cowboys become a target and then they, they, they fade away and then they circle back again because um, there's, there's something about the lifestyle that people admire. And so again, it circled back with the urban cowboy craze. And I'm, I'm old enough to remember that. Late 70s, early 80s, you had not only Urban Cowboy, you also had Electric Horseman with Robert Redford. You also had Tom Horn, mm. Steve McQueen's last movie. And they're all happening right about 1980. Mm. And so, you know, the tall crown hats that you see with the exploding with the pheasant feather, feathers. Yeah, yeah. You know, I had one of those. That's how old I am. <laughs> I had one of those and uh, went up to St. Joseph, Missouri and bought one of those from the Stetson uh, warehouse. And, uh, uh, and, you know, that was another craze. And everybody's wearing Tony Lama boots and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah. And, and then it fades away again, you know. Um, and now it's circling back. But, you know, uh, there are those of us who, you know, whether we're not we're working cows or, or not, you know, I'm not a cowboy, but I, I like to say I get to play one on TV or I get to play one as an historian. And yes, sir. I can speak for those who can't speak for themselves anymore mm. uh, because their histories deserve to be known. You know, that's, it's popular to, to use a phrase, say their name. Well, guess what? There are others whose, whose names mean, need, need to be said, too. Mm. And, and those are cowboys of color as well. And that's another thing that I've been heavily involved in is uh, this zeal to right all the wrongs of the last couple of centuries as uh, there's all kinds of a far, false narrative out there now 
about cowboys of color. Um, and I've had to push back against that. I'm going to appear in a documentary um, by Al Roker Productions, for example, on black cowboys and just filmed another one down in Dallas at the state fair about that whole, that whole thing. And, you know, people, you know, zeal is a good thing, but it also, if it run, r runs unchecked, it ha does more damage, you know? Yes, sir. You know, they're an important part of the story, but they all, that's, that's the significant thing is they're part of the story, not the whole story. Right. And so, you know, that's what I've done here at the, at the National Cowboy Museum in particular, is focus on the, uh, those original Spanish baquetos and eventually Mexican baquetos. That's where cowboying starts. Right. Uh, with Cowboy Ground Zero being in Africa, you know, those technologies come out of Africa through Spain to Mexico and then up north in Texas and so on. So that's a more complete story. It's also a more interesting story. Yeah. You know, you're telling just one, one part and, and you're, you're, uh, you're, you're cheating your audience, so to speak. Yeah, I'd love to like take a USB port and download a fraction of the history you have in your, in your brain. <laughs> um, and, and so I'll, I'll segue into what you're doing as a curator. Um, how, you know, I saw you all day doing these tours and you got your obligations with the ceremony going on later on today. And so I applaud you for, for doing what you're doing. How many of these things, how many tours are you doing in a given day? Um, in, a, in a regular time, you know, when yeah. we don't have a captive audience, you know, I'll, I'll do oh, three to four a week, generally okay. in different, different groups from different parts of the country. For example, about a month ago, Red brought his, uh, Red Stegall brought his Red Rangers. And those are guys that are interested in the West who you may or may not have any, any true interest or, or experience with cows, but they love the West and they like mm -hmm. to learn about it. So they came here and I gave them one of those full museum tours and then they went up on up the road to uh, Pawnee Bill's Wild West Show Ranch, which is a, a great idea for example, but there'll be people from New Jersey or Japan or whatever that'll show up and yeah. it'll, it'll be a bus tour. So uh, today it's kind of a captive audience. These are people that are, you know, passionate about the West, but the more times we tell it, the, the more people that will have a ripple effect on, you know, um, because I was, I don't know who I was standing next to today, but maybe it was Wyatt McCray, Joel McCray's grandson, who's on our board. I think that's who, who I was talking to. And you know, I was, we, I, we were talking about how important it is to keep this going. You know, we like what you do. It's vital what you do, absolutely vital. Um, and not only just today because with all the challenges that we're facing, but we can't stop, we can't give up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a World War I buff, um, and I, when they, they established the National World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C., finally, over 100 years after that war is over with, I heard a quote or I read a quote that said, the only way a soldier ever dies is when people stop saying their name. That's the only time they're ever forgotten. And the same is true of cowboy culture and, mm -hmm. and that cowboy lifestyle. That's the only way it's ever going to die mm -hmm. is when we stop talking about it. Yes, sir. And so what you do, it's a, you have a sacred duty. It's a sacred covenant, just like I do, to take care of these artifacts. You take care of it by reaching out to these different, different not only constituencies through your audience, but also to the people who are still doing the work. Yes, sir. You know, because most of them remain anonymous. Like Red always says, you can't see a cowboy from the highway. <laughs> you can't see a cowboy from the blacktop. That's true. You know? And that's, that's a true, true, there's no truer statement. Yeah. You know, and I always love that about Red because he'll give it to you straight yeah. every time. Yeah. And it's not easy. And in today's instant gratification society, it takes a little work to do what you do. And I admire what you're doing. I Thank really you. do. It's vital it. what you're doing. And so Thank I appreciate you, sir. that. I appreciate, appreciate you saying that. Um, I've heard, I heard a quote that somebody said, the worst way to do something is, or no, let me take that back. The best way to do something is how your grandfather did it. And the worst way to do something is the way your grandfather did it. And so it's like both statements are true, yet they contradict each other. So my question to you is, how do you keep the traditions of cowboys from days gone by, how do you keep that stuff alive yet keep a progressive mindset to Im improve or, or change that lifestyle in, in a certain way? Does that make sense? Yeah, it's, a, it's actually a great question. Um, and I'll, I'll answer it in, the, in this respect. You know, there's been a great deal of uh, attempts. There've been a great number of attempts to erase the past thinking that's somehow gonna heal. I'm not a destructionist, I'm a constructionist. I believe in building up rather than tearing down. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to tear down anything that my grandfather did. Uh, if I can improve on it, that's up to me. That's a choice I have to make. 
but I'm not going to tear him down or vilify him in any way, shape, or form because I wasn't there. I wasn't in that context. I wasn't in that time, and that's sure. a different time, and it's unfair to judge mm -hmm. from where I am now to, to his time. But at the same time, I might be able to improve on it, do it a little bit better, or certainly a little bit differently. Right. You know, and so, you know, I agree with your statement, and that's actually something that's somewhat prevalent in the museum world these days is this zeal to, to you know, blow everything up and start all over again. I don't, I don't agree with that at all. Mm -hmm. um, so if we have a monument to, to John Wayne out front, um, that, I think that's wonderful. But John Wayne was an actor. Better right. uh, put uh, Tom Blazingame, longtime cowboy for the JAs over there in West Texas, who died, who they found uh, uh, with his horse standing, neck rain to the, or the ground rain to the ground, uh, uh, just laid down on the ground and died, you know? And uh, that's the way every cowboy ought to go. And uh, I'd rather have a statue to Tom Blazingame out there next to a statue of Bill Pickett. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So then you, you, have, you throw two true balance. You tear, tear things down, things will never get rebalanced again. Right. You know, so right. before you start, you know, uh, blowing everything up, Take a step back, take a deep breath, uh, and, uh, and and take a measure of what, what you're about to do. You know, mm -hmm. there's a, in, in Lonesome Dove, a book that I treasured. I've read it seven times, believe it or not. Uh, it's one impressive. Of the greatest, greatest books ever written. I uh, also read Lord of the Rings seven times, so that'll tell you something. <laughs> uh, there's a, there's a, a part where, uh, where Augustus McRae says something to the effect, it's, it, there's nothing like seeing a, a new country on the back of a fine horse. Mm. And uh, that was something my, you know, let's say my grandfather did, um, saw a new country on the back of a fine horse. That was his way of doing it. And there's nothing that really changes. Everything's cyclical, it'll circle back. And so sure. um, there are improvements or sometimes it's just a different point of view. That doesn't make either one wrong or right. It's right. just different. Yeah. I agree. I agree 100%. Um, I want to talk about your book. Okay. Let's talk about that, where the idea came from, how long it took you to write it. I hear other, other folks I know that have written books say that is one of the hardest things they've ever done, and it's just a beat down. And, but then at the end, they say they're glad they did it, and they start writing another one. Right. Um, the Bugby book... Uh, really started when I got the job at Panhandle Plains and being a bachelor at that time I didn't know anybody in Canyon, Texas and uh, one of the first things I was told is that uh, his widow Mrs. Bugby who was I must have been in her 80s then I guess uh, she still volunteered at the museum even though she'd retired a few years before that and would still drive 150 miles round trip from Clarendon to Canyon every day rain or shine didn't matter mm -hmm. um, and I was told uh, you know don't make her mad um, because there's still treasures in the house that are going to come here. So that's the first thing I did was made, made her mad. Um, <laughs> How did you do that? I don't really know. Um, <laughs> probably just doing things differently than what the way she, she'd done it. But she and I became fast friends, and I spent most of my weekends down at the Bugby Ranch rooting around in the house or out, on the, out on the, uh, uh, in the pastures around the house or in, driving with her while she told me stories about when Mr. Bugby was on the JAs, the ROs, or, or wherever, whatever ranch we were on, mm -hmm. um, you know, just different stories. And then uh, rooting around in the house, um, his studio was still largely intact in the basement, um, except there was a leakage problem. So his Navajo saddle blankets were laying on the floor in puddles of water. Oh, and man. I said to her, you know, Mrs. Bugby, we might want to get those out of the water. Mm -hmm. um, and I was concerned about the climate down there, which wasn't very good because the house was, you know, coming up on 100 years old by that time and it had settled and so on. What year was this? Uh, this would have been 1987, 1988. Okay. House was built in 1913. Okay. Uh, four square prairie style house. Uh, it, it, important architecturally enough where the Historic American Building Survey uh, from Texas Tech went out there and did a... Uh, did measure drawings and recorded it for the National Register. That's how important that house was mm. and is. Um, so Mr. Bugby Studio was in there, and I got to know his work by literally looking at it, you know all the sketches that were still there, oil field studies, all kinds of stuff. Um, and you know, 
I didn't know who he was when I got the job and never heard of him because, you know, he passed in 63 and I was only two. Mm -hmm. um, but when I started looking more and more, I'd start seeing his work in different magazines or books. And he was a very prolific illustrator for Western books, uh, especially as a pen and ink artist. And then at, at Panhandle Plains, when you walk in the front hall, the original building called Pioneer Hall, there is a series of eight murals in there, five of which Mr. Bugby painted. So I'm literally immersed in his work every single day I go to work. Yeah. And so um, originally I, what I wanted to do was write a biography of him because he was apparently a really quiet person. You know, he'd sit in a room with you and you didn't even know he was there. And I heard this so many times, the only way you knew he was in the room was he was always sketching somebody's portrait on whatever piece of paper it was, back of an envelope or whatever. So the scritch, scritch, scritch was how you knew because he wouldn't, he, he was real shy. Uh, plus, uh, you know, he was a native New Englander, so he spoke with a real serious Yankee accent. Mm. And I think that kind of embarrassed him just a little bit I being see. in the West. So, you know, I, just gathering these stories uh, in my head and being surrounded with his art. Um, and because he knew all these historic people, he, he was friends with Charles Goodnight. Mm. I mean, who's friends with Charles Goodnight? You wow. know, Goodnight lived till 1929. Most people don't realize how late he lived. Uh, but, you know, famous Westerners, like I mentioned in my speech yesterday, Frank Collins, and who had been a buffalo hunter, he'd been a cowboy, he'd been a rancher. Um, and Buck, Mr. Bugby illustrated the stories that, for Collins, and for example, that appeared in Ranch Romances magazine over a decade. Mm. Um, his own cousin, Mr. Bugby's own cousin, T.S. Bugby, uh, was a cattle rancher in southwestern Kansas and probably would have been the first rancher in the Texas Panhandle, except the, uh, the, uh, Either the Canadian or the Cimarron River was at flood stage, and he couldn't get his herds across, so he had to wait. And so Goodnight got there before or before he did. Hmm. Um, so he's, he's, he knows all these people, all these historic figures, Native Americans too, both in Oklahoma and New Mexico. Um, and he was just a fascinating guy who just seemed to be at the right place at the right time and all these things. Right. And uh, so I originally wanted to write a straight biography, but the people at Texas A&M University Press said, you know, he's such an important artist, but nobody remembers his work. So why don't we do a, a, a book that kind of reintroduces his art to the world? And I agreed reluctantly, um, honestly, because I, you know, I felt, and it's supposed to be a two-part thing, so there'll be a full-blown biography that'll come out later. Um, if, you know, if I get to writing, you know. Yeah. And so the, book, the book's done incredibly well. I mean, we can't keep it on the shelves here in our, own, our own store. That's awesome. And uh, it's really kind of surprising. And, and I'll be honest with you, uh, I still don't know who nominated it for the Wrangler because the university press didn't do it, and I certainly didn't do it. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know how it got was even considered. And uh, yeah. when I first got the notification, I thought I thought they'd misdialed or something. <laughs> you know, did you hit send by accident? You know? Yeah. So, you know, it's an incredible honor, especially all the people that – have come before me that got Wrangler Awards. I mean, dang. Yeah. You know, those are giants. You know, not only in Western history, but Western art history and and uh, those actors and so on. I mean, whew, that's mighty mighty tall company. So, what were some of the talk to me about like how long it how long did it take start to finish? Once you committed and said, "Okay, yes, I will do it and I'll do it this way." How long did it take start to finish and then what hurdles came up along the way for you? I was gathering it's a little like an archaeological dig. And so those stories that Olive told me beginning in the late 80s, um, I, I would put them away in notes. I kept files, um, voluminous files and different things. What I'd would you do? Like some, write them down in a journal? Write them down uh, or, or note down or make a photocopy or whatever it was. And she'd really done a good job in documenting Harold's career. Um, and so I relied a lot on the research that she did. She never really planned to write a book as far as I know. And so it was really just gathering field notes, literally field notes uh, on different things that I'd run across or I'd put two and two together and write it down. And um, so it, ultimately it was about a 30 year project, start to finish, you know? Um, and, you know, I think that's about the right amount of time. And I'm not saying every book should take 30 years, that's not what I mean. Um, but to do it justice, mm -hmm. it's, it's like lived history, so to speak. Yeah. Um, being there in the house with her, listening to those stories. And then when she passed in 2003, um, those stories kind of stopped with me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a sacred duty to tell his story. 
um, because I don't want him to be forgotten again. Right. And it's not about me, it's about him and it's about her. Sure. Um, but what about you as the writer though? Uh, what about you as the writer? And, and like, I'm curious to know about that, like your process, do you sit down? Is there a certain time? Or are you just writing whenever it hits you or? Um, I, I actually have to um, budget time to, to write and I have to stay committed to it. And it takes a lot of discipline mm -hmm. because I'm still only seven years old and I'm easily distracted. <laughs> Same, um, man. Especially, exactly. especially in the museum field because there's always a new artifact to research or what, this or that. Um, so I had to stay committed. And, and, you know, my wife's to be credited a lot for that because uh, there were times when she'd just say, like I said at the speech yesterday, uh, shouldn't you be writing rather than watching the Cowboys on TV or watching the Chiefs on TV? Um, or, you know, watching this, uh, watching open range for the 50th time. Um, so she would hold you accountable. Uh, she did. She did. And, uh, and so that actually helped. But um, I'll be honest with you, what was really the kicker for me to finally get this done is when I, when I got this job um, in 20, or I took the job and started here in September of 2018 and I went in the vault. And I think I knew that I knew this, but I forgot that I knew this. There's a major painting by Mr. Bugby in this collection. And the fact that his work is in the National Cowboy Museum says a lot. And we've had it since the mid 60s. I mean, in other words, we got it right after the place opened. And yet, um, as far as I can tell, I'm not sure it ever got exhibited. It came from, it was actually a commissioned painting from a, uh, the widow of a major rancher in Canadian Texas who eventually moved to Wichita, Kansas. Hmm. And that's how it came to us, is down from Wichita. And seeing that and knowing that it had not been shown here before, and knowing all the other important public collections in which his work is represented, including the Smithsonian, um, it's high time that people know who he was again. And so when I write, I don't think so much about me because I have to remember that I'm the pipe, not the source. Yeah, I'm merely a conduit. I'm merely a way. Mm -hmm. And it's not about me. It's about him. It's about the topic. It's about the subject. So when I'm given a tour, for example, it's not about me. It's about uh, uh, I'm called to do this, this work. I, I, I truly believe that. It's a spiritual calling. Um, to speak for those who can't for themselves, not, not yeah. to toot my own horn, but to make sure they're not forgotten. And these stories aren't forgotten or these facts aren't forgotten. Yeah. So the same thing is true for the Bugby book. Uh, I have an obligation to him. And, and I know it sounds kind of funny, but I don't, it may sound funny to some people. I don't believe in a coincidence. There's no such thing. There is a plan. Uh, there's somebody in charge and it ain't me. Right. Uh, but things happen for a reason. Mr. Bugby died on my birthday. Oh, wow. And, and so I always felt that connection to him. Hmm. And the one thing that I still is on my bucket list, I've never heard him speak. And I know there are recordings of him, but I've never been able to hear him. Um, it's like touching in a place, like those, those ruts for the Western Cattle Trail mm -hmm. or standing in the ruts of the Santa Fe Trail or whatever it is, uh, touching a building where something Incredible happened. Yeah, you know, where where are they? Like, what have you? Um, there's a, there's that's a, a silly question. There's a woman. That, you would. There's a woman them. in Amarillo who uh, happened to record his 50th birthday party in Canyon, and she told me all these years I've got this reel to reel recording of his birthday party, and not only was was he there, but the the, the great Western historian uh, Jay of its Haley was there. The publisher out of El Paso, Carl Herzog, was there. So there are other people on this tape. Mm. And she wasn't teasing me with it, don't get me wrong. It just never happened I that I ever got to listen to it. And I think she was, after a while, you kind of start to fear that maybe that reel to reel's gotten too too brittle to, to play. I see. So um, I see. that's just one of my things. I got so, you. Yeah. That'd be a special moment. Oh my gosh, yes. When no, that happens. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I've got a few a few more questions for okay. you, Michael, that I ask every guest that comes on the show. Um, you're a very stoic man from, from what little I know of you. Um, no, not really. I'm, and, and I'm curious to know your thoughts on this. So with the knowledge that you have today, if you could go back in time and give your 20-year-old self advice, what advice would that be? Listen better. Uh, listen better. Um, read the signs better because the signs aren't hard to read but you know pride and 
youthful exuberance and other things get in the way. I'm curious and stubbornness. What you, the signs of life. Yep. How do you, that's a man, I'm glad you said that. Like, how do you know? Like, how do you know to trust that? Is that intuition or is that resistance? Like, well, fear trying to stop me from. Only with seasoning, because I'm, I'm 60, only with seasoning do I know that um, if I have peace about a thing, it comes from God. If I'm in turmoil about something, uh, that doesn't come from Him. Uh, he has a plan and that's to do me no harm. And uh, if, I, if I listen to that and not fight it, because I will and I have, sure. um, my own stubbornness, my own lack of humility, yeah. um, I often make uh, wrong decisions or I force decisions or force solutions, which then ultimately are not solutions. They just become problems. Yeah. So uh, um, listen better, read the signs better, show more humility, and I'm not trying to say I'm an arrogant person, I'm just meaning that, uh, and some of that comes from conditioning of my own self. That can't possibly be right. I'm still not sure I really got a Wrangler Award, for example. You know, that it seems surreal to me. It's like, is it like an imposter syndrome? Like yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I, I'm just a poser and, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, a lot of people feel that. Yeah, it's, 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 it's frustrating, frankly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I had my daughter uh, one time tell me not too long ago, he says, she said to me, she says, Dad, you deserve to be happy. And you know, when your children tell you, mouths of babes, um, that usually gets your attention finally. So yeah, I need to be more willing to listen. Um, that's what I would tell my younger self. Listen, pay attention, uh, and accept what, what's, what's handed to you. Right on. You know? So acceptance right is the key. Yeah, and I agree with what you said earlier about the, the turmoil. Um, I, I feel like God may put turmoil in our lives for our own benefit sometimes. It's up to us to, it's our choice on how we perceive those things on, and to choose that lens of perception right. as right. good. Right, mm -hmm. I, think, uh, I think God does allow us to work our way through challenges. Mm -hmm. He never hurts us. Yeah. I don't believe that at all. Yeah. You know, we may not understand the why, yeah, I say that all the time. You know, I, I uh, agree. And I don't get to know the why. <laughs> His ways are not my ways. Yeah, exactly. Um, I got one more question for you. Yep. And I ask everybody this. This is the last question of the show. If you could, metaphorically speaking, put a message on a billboard to go out to millions of people, what would your message be? Wow. Love all God's children right where they are today. Beautiful. That's what I would say. Beautiful. I struggle with that, and I pray for that every morning. You know, practice, help me, help right? me, help me to love practice. all. Yeah, you bet. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Practice makes progress. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, Michael, that's all I have for you, well, my good. friend. Good. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate you coming this, on the it's show. It's an honor to talk to you, sir. Absolutely. Pleasure to meet you yes, as well. Sir. If I can help you with anything else in the future, let me know. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm glad you all are here. Thank, Thank you. you. Hope there's something there you can use. Thank you for having us. All right, guys, we just finished up with interviews here in Oklahoma City at the Western Heritage Museum, and it was truly a pleasure. Mr. Barry Corbin, Patrick Wayne, and Michael Grauer. I'd, I'd like to thank Ghostwood Distilling Company for having us out and making this possible. It was truly a pleasure to, uh, to spend the day here at the museum and, and check out uh, everything that, that this place has to offer. Um, it is like stepping back in time. So um, truly a pleasure for that. And then also I'm looking forward to the ceremony tonight and, and what, what else is to come. So thank you all for tuning in. And until next time, stay grateful.